Hi, welcome to our session on insights on outcomes using MSCs for patients with COVID. I'm Fred Sanfilippo. I'm director of the Emory Georgia Tech Healthcare Innovation Program and professor of pathology lab medicine and health policy and management at Emory. And it's my pleasure to moderate this session. As you know, COVID infection is a multi-system inflammatory disease that can affect lungs, heart, brain, GI systems, among others, and can be particularly severe in the elderly and children at risk. So we're fortunate to have an outstanding panel of experts who've worked with MSCs in these areas prior to COVID and are now applying their expertise and experience to patients with COVID. In this session, we'll ask each of them to spend a few minutes giving us their insights on the potential of MSCs for treating COVID along with the current clinical status of their use. We'll follow this with an open discussion, so please submit your questions on the audience Q&A tab, and we'll try to get to as many of these as possible. Our first panelist is Michael Matei. I know Michael has conflicts out on the West Coast. Michael, are you there? Well, I don't hear Michael, um, so we'll come back to him hopefully when he is joining, able to join. So our next panelist is Josh Hare, cardiologist, who directs the uh, uh, Institute for Cell Therapy at the University of Miami. He's led MSC trials for heart disease and frailty among others, and is now involved in several IMDs regarding uh, treatment for COVID patients. Josh, delighted to have you. Uh, interested in your insights. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you and thank the organizers for uh, including me in this panel. Um, I'm gonna start out with a, a brief slideshow and to set the stage for what, we, what we've talked about and what has already been in, introduced this morning by the previous panel. Um, these are some disclosures I'd like to uh, share with the panel. In particular, I'm the uh, scientific founder of two stem cell companies called uh, Vestion and Longevron. The, we're in the midst of the worst, worst healthcare crisis of our time. And um, this is why we're all having this conference by Zoom rather than being in person in Washington, DC. Um, this is a, a viral illness and we have learned a tremendous amount of, about it in the last uh, several months. One of the most exciting things I think from the scientific field is how scientists have really banded together to really understand this disease and think about ways to approach it and treat it. Uh, I'd just like to show a few schematics over the next three slides. Now I won't go into any of these in detail, but for those of you who want more scientific information, uh, I'd, I'd uh, refer you to the publications here. Um, in a, in a simplified way, we can think about COVID-19, uh, the COVID-19 syndrome, which is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus as having three stages. The very first stage is, is the viral response. Then we have a pulmonary response. <clears throat> and then finally, we have an inflammatory response. In the first phase of the viral response, one of the key things is that there's a reduction in our immune cells. So the virus is actually shutting off the immune system to allow its spread to be uh, more, more severe. It then affects the lungs, and then it can, because of this inflammatory response, affect uh, multiple parts of the body. <clears throat> now, one of the key mediators of this is, uh, is something we've heard about many times. It's called the cytokine release syndrome, and the cytokines released in response to the infection have an adverse effect on various other cells of the body, macrophages, dendritic cells, and, um, and monocytes. These are cells of the immune system. The inflammation makes things worse and, and makes it more difficult for the body to actually clear the virus. Okay. I'm having trouble advancing my slide. Can somebody at the organizer uh, help me advance the slide, please? Okay. There we go. Um, now, one of the things we do know about the uh, cytokines is uh, there's some controversy about how important these cytokines are, but we certainly know 
that the higher the level of the cytokines are, the less likely a patient is to uh, survive. So if you look at survivors and non-survivors, if you look at a cytokine called interleukin-6, it's much higher in the non-survivors. Now, what about, why mesenchymal stem cells? We, we've been on a frantic scientific search for different therapies over the last six months. We've had the approval of one antiviral drug and we've had positive results from uh, an anti-inflammatory study using steroids. Now, why would we think about using mesenchymal stem cells if we already have an anti-inflammatory therapy in steroids? Well, we know a lot about mesenchymal stem cells. And one of the fascinating things about mesenchymal stem cells is that they do many, many things. As Dr. Kurtzberg talked about earlier in her introductory comments, these are living cells. They can be used as an allograft from a donor and they do many, many things. And in, in a simplified way, they make the immune system that has been adversely affected by the virus better. So the effects on macrophages, dendritic cells, and T cells are favorable. And some of, one of our key ideas is that these cells may actually reduce the inflammation, but also enhance antiviral effects and the clearance of the virus. We have been studying mesenchymal stem cells or mesenchymal scromal cells. As Dr. Kurtzberg also mentioned, there's some controversy about what we should call them, but if we just call them MSCs, then everybody will be on the same page. They are living cells. They have a CD105 receptor on their surface, which allows scientists and physicians to identify them and expand them. And we've been conducting phase one and two trials with these studies for over 15 years. We've learned some key lessons. These cells can be used as an allograft. They can be taken from a, one donor and given to a different recipient. And we've learned a lot about how to give them to human beings safely, either by intravenous infusion or direct injection into their organs. We know that the safety profile of these cells, if properly produced in a correct and safe environment called the CGMP environment, is extremely acceptable. This is a very safe treatment. We also have been testing these infusions in a lot of vulnerable po populations, older individuals, very old individuals with frailty and those with advanced cardiac or pulmonary diseases. Phase one and two studies have been conducted in these populations and have been by and large uh, shown to be safe and have very exciting hints of potential efficacy. So these trials have led to advancing clinical development and a number of cardiac pulmonary GI and immunologic indications. And those of us in the field are very excited by the fact that the US FDA is considering a BLA submitted by mesoblast for an immunologic disease called graft versus host disease. There are already some approvals around the world in Europe and Japan of MSC therapy. So this is the future of medicine. This is something that's coming and we do have to study it more intently and learn much more about it. So what about using the mesenchymal stem cell or the MSC in COVID-19 ARDS? Um, a number of phase one and two trials are already ongoing. And there are previous phase one and two trials for ARDS, but in the pre-COVID area. There are numerous case series that have emerged, open label studies in which COVID-19 patients have been treated. And there are phase three trials already underway. The results that those of us have seen, the experts in the field, and you've heard, you'll hear much more about this today, are very, very encouraging. I want to tell you briefly about the program we've led at the University of Miami. It's called an expanded access program, where under FDA regulations, we've been allowed to give individual patients who are very, very ill with COVID-19 mesenchymal stem cell infusions. We've received requests from throughout the country, critical care colleagues, and these requests are increasing and the experience with treating these patients has been very encouraging. In particular, we focused on the sickest of patients, patients whose lungs are so bad that they need to be supported by an external, external machine called an ECMO machine. This goes beyond just putting patients on a ventilator. This is a machine that actually provides the oxygen directly into the blood because the lungs are incapable of receiving oxygen even on a ventilator. 
We've treated 14 patients, nine of whom were on ECMO. And of those patients, we have a 78% survival versus 55% in a control group. So our numbers are very small. This is not a controlled study. And I emphasize how committed our group is and our colleagues are to doing randomized placebo controlled studies so we can get a, a firm answer about this. Our group, the ACT Now group, has initiated a clinical trial consortium and has a randomized trial approved by the FDA comparing cord versus bone marrow derived MSCs for COVID-19 ARDS. I can share with you some early experience from uh, a few patients who were treated in the expanded axis who were on the ECMO machine. And again, this is not randomized data, but this is just our experience. It is something that we're very encouraged by. The first is on the left panel, you can see that the higher the level of the interleukin-6 was when the patient presented correlates very nicely with the decline. So no matter how high the interleukin-6 is, as the patients are recovering, once they're getting infusions of mesenchymal stem cells, they, these levels decline to normal. You can also see the chest X-ray clearance of the infiltrates on the lungs of the patient. You can see this very white, uh, bad area and the lungs clear. This correlates with the improvement in oxygenation in the blood. Many of these very sick patients have been able to be discharged from the hospital and sent home. But again, I emphasize our commitment to placebo controlled trials and the importance of executing these trials in a multi-center fashion. So uh, these are the trials that, that we have approved under FDA IND and, and which we plan to uh, uh, initiate and complete in the next few months. The uh, National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute CCTRN consortium has applied for a placebo controlled double gland double blind trial in patients with elevated troponin. These are patients in whom the virus has spread and is now affecting the heart in addition to lungs. Our group, the Alliance for Cell Therapy Now, has approved our trial, which I alluded to in the last slide. It's the comparison of cord versus bone marrow MSCs. We have our expanded access program ongoing, patients on ECMO. And there are now a number of ongoing trials that have looked, are looking at ARDS patients with COVID-19 at all different stages of a severity of illness. Um, <clears throat> so in summary, I'd like to just conclude that uh, COVID-19 clinical manifestations do involve important immunologic changes. One of the earliest changes is the reduction in lymphocytes which we believe can enhance the, the ability of the virus to spread. The cytokine release uh, syndrome also plays an important role and it plays a role in, a, in uh, the spread of the illness to multiple other organs beyond the lungs. Um, our group has been very interested in mesenchymal stem cells for many years. We've done trials from, from the beginning of this field these cells can be either called mesenchymal stem cells, mesenchymal stromal cells, others call them medicinal stem cells. They all can be abbreviated MSCs, whatever you call them. They can be identified by having a, a zip code signature, which is a protein on the cell surface called CD105. We know that the cells are safe as an allograft. We know that they have favorable effects on the immune system reducing T and B cell function and reducing cytokine release syndrome. I've described to you the multiple clinical trials that are ongoing, including one for cardiac involvement as opposed to just pulmonary involvement. Um, that these are based on a background of the fact that MSCs have been tested in multiple phase one and two trials in older individuals, those with congestive heart failure and other pulmonary diseases, so that we know that sick, vulnerable patients can tolerate these infusions. And we, uh, we are living in an era where the first phase three trials of these MSCs have been completed for several other indications with ongoing phase three trials, very specifically targeting the COVID-19 syndrome. Thank you very much for making these comments. This is my team at the University of Miami, a tremendous team, and I look forward to the ongoing discussion today. Great, well, thanks Josh uh, for that great summary and the work that you're doing. And we're gonna hold questions till after the, all the presentations and uh, 
and apologize for the uh, live streaming that uh, delayed your, your presentation. Uh, our next discuss and panelist is Dr. Joanne Kurtzberg, I think someone known to everyone. Uh, she's a pediatrician, director of the Marcus Center for Cellular Cures at Duke. Um, she's led MSC trials in children with autism, cerebral palsy, uh, a range of trials for a variety of uh, other disorders, and is now beginning a trial for children with multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Joanne, delighted to have you. Uh, thank you, and I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Um, and I need you to tell me if you see it in the presentation mode or the, I think I have to swap it. Do you see it in the presentation? Yeah, yeah. Now, now we do. Okay. Um, well, thank you all. And it's a pleasure to participate in this panel and to talk with you about uh, cell therapy applications for COVID. Um, I'll start by saying COVID is uh, fortunately often less severe in children, although it occurs. And uh, as Fred mentioned, there is a serious life-threatening condition that can follow a COVID infection in small numbers of children called multi-inflammatory syndrome in childhood. Um, and we are uh, beginning a trial to test cord tissue-derived MSCs in that diagnosis. Um, but because we're at the beginning of that journey, I thought I would tell you a little bit more about uh, some of the uh, potential for cell therapy in regenerative, ap regenerative medicine applications in children. So um, just as a brief overview, um, many diseases are now uh, being treated through clinical trials uh, to test whether various cell therapies have benefit and are safe. And uh, just a handful of those diseases are listed on the left-hand side of the slide, but they include asthma, autism, bronchopulmonary dysplasia in premature infants, COVID MISC, cerebral palsy, uh, acute graft-versus-host disease, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy in newborns, leukodystrophies, spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, and then in our work, we're also doing a study in COVID ARDS in adults. Um, and the cell types vary, um, but the most uh, commonly used cell types that are being tested are bone marrow derived mesenchymal stromal cells, uh, cord blood derived uh, blood stem cells or immunotherapies as you heard Colleen Delaney talking about in the last session or cells for neurologic repair, which can be derived from cord blood monocytes. And then cord tissue, as well as other birthing tissues, are excellent sources of uh, material to manufacture uh, mesenchymal stromal cells. And we in our laboratory manufacture cord tissue MSCs for therapeutic use under IND. Um, now, why are uh, MSCs uh, important cells? Josh alluded to this already, but they're capable of modulating inflammation. And they can also signal endogenous cells to promote tissue regeneration. Um, and um, MISC in children is a pro-inflammatory condition. And we hope that by using MSCs, they'll suppress and downregulate this inflammation uh, and prevent the processes that are going uh, that cause uh, widespread systemic tissue damage to the heart, to the lungs, to the brain, to the kidneys, and the other organs. Um, and although we can't yet give you data in MISC, um, there is significant data, as Josh mentioned, particularly from Mesoblast, which has applied for a BLA from the FDA uh, for using bone marrow-derived MSCs to treat acute steroid refractory GVHD in children. And that is a pro-inflammatory condition where the studies that Mesoblast have, has conducted have shown that MSC are down-regulating inflammation both systemically and locally in the involved organs, including the gut and the liver um, to control the disease. Um, and through the Mesoblast studies over the past 10 years, there have been more than 4,000 doses of MSCs given to children uh, from infancy uh, to 21 years of age and the safety profile is excellent. 
and in acute steroid refractory GVHD in children. And the response rates are uh, about 70% in a disease that would otherwise have about a 90% mortality at two years. Um, in my work at Duke, uh, we manufacture three types of therapeutic cells under GMP, and they are being tested uh, in a variety of diseases under INDs. Um, so cord blood, which is the baby's blood left over in the placenta uh, after a baby is born and which used to be discarded as, uh, as medical waste, can be harvested and cryopreserved or frozen and then used as a source of blood stem cells for uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for people who don't have a matched donor, either in their family or in the adult registry. Um, and FDA uh, issued guidance for licensure of public banks uh, in about 2011, and there are now seven licensed, licensed public banks in the United States. Um, in addition to the blood stem cells, monocytes in cord blood are very active in treating brain injury, and I'll show you a, a little bit of data for that. Um, and um, the immune cells in cord blood can also be developed into therapeutic products. Um, core tissue MSCs, which are manufactured under GMP over about a three month period, modulate and suppress inflammation and are currently in trials in children with GVHD, autism, uh, MISC, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, and in adults with COVID ARDS and osteoarthritis of the knee. And I won't talk about it, but we, there also is a cell that can be manufactured from cord blood monocytes, we call DUOC, which is capable of inducing remyelination of the brain. And we have that in trials in children with leukodystrophies and are planning trials in adults with multiple sclerosis. Um, this just shows you some data about cord blood monocytes being able to rescue brain tissue from hypoxic injury. In the top three panels on the right, you see healthy brain on the left with green neurons. You see injured brain in the middle where the neurons die. And you see rescued brain on the right uh, where the brain uh, slice has been incubated with cord blood monocytes and or cord blood MSCs because they both will provide this type of rescue from acute hypoxic injury. And interestingly, adult blood can, cannot provide the same rescue. So um, we also have shown that um, cord blood monocytes and cord tissue MSCs can rescue microglial cells from activation in the brain. So on the far left, you see normal microglial cells with nice processes. In the middle, you see ballooned up, injured, activated microglial cells. And on the right, you see those same cells, but rescued with a co-incubation with MSCs. And this type of demonstration in the laboratory is important to understand how MSCs downregulate inflammation. And in our case, this is particularly imp important to provide a mechanism of action and rationale to treat children with autism who are known to have microglial activation. In our work with cerebral palsy, um, and these are published studies. I'll just summarize by saying we showed that infusions of cord blood, and this, in this case, it was autologous or the child's own cord blood, uh, resulted in improved motor function in children and also new development of motor tracts in the brain shown in the three bottom images if the children received the proper dose of, M of uh, cord blood, which was 25 million cells per kilo. We duplicated that in a cord blood sibling trial. And then we said, all right, let's ask the question, is cord blood the best source or are MSCs also active in this condition? And so we did a randomized phase two trial uh, where children either receive very high dose donor cord blood or three doses of MSCs from cord tissue or a natural history arm for observation, where children at the end of the observation period, which was a year, got a dose of cord blood. Um, so we know the results of this study now, and surprisingly, we learned that the cord blood was very effective um, in this condition of cerebral palsy, which is not an active inflammatory condition, but the cord tissue MSCs were not effective. So I'll just show this to say this is why 
randomized clinical trials are really important and assumptions you might make uh, are, you know, around expectation of a cell that may or may not work aren't good enough. Um, we've also looked at cord blood and cord tissue MSCs in children with autism. And um, in a recently published randomized trial of cord blood, um, we showed that in four to seven year olds with uh, uh, out intellectual disability, that infusion of cord blood improved communication and socialization on a Vineland uh, scale. And also that donor cord blood improved function on something called a CGI or clinical global improvement scale. And that those were correlated with changes in EEG um, and eye tracking. So we had both a behavioral outcome and an objective neurophysiological outcome correlating with response. And we're now studying cord tissue MSCs in children with autism and we completed and published a dose finding study, giving one, two, or three doses over a four month period to 12 children with autism. And we were able to show that safety was excellent and that 58% uh, of the patients improved on at least two of three outcome measures for efficacy that we described. Um, so we're excited about this. And we're currently embarking on a phase two randomized placebo controlled trial that is blinded to really ask the question, do these cells work in these children? Um, so through all of this work, we know that um, giving MSCs to, to sick patients um, in the inpatient setting or the outpatient setting is well tolerated and safe. And we know what doses to use. Um, and we've embarked on a trial of, a, of um, adult ARDS and co that's caused by COVID. Um, and uh, there's a phase one and a randomized phase two component where we're giving three consecutive doses of a million cells per kilogram. And then the MISC study in children, which is a phase one study where we'll be giving four doses over a week of 2 million cells per kilogram. And we hope that we'll see the same effects of modulation of inflammation in this disease as we've seen in diseases with similar pathology and similar pro-inflammatory states. And we also hope to see the same safety profile we've seen in the other studies I described. So the takeaways are that cell therapies have enormous potential. Success has been demonstrated with the MSCs in children with acute GVHD, which is a pro-inflammatory disease. Um, the safety profile is excellent. Studies in multi-inflammatory syndrome in children are starting and investment in clinical trials is needed to realize the potential of these cells. So I'll stop there and thank you very much. Great. Well Thanks, Joanne. And again, we're getting a lot of questions. We're going to hold those till the end of the discussion. So uh, those with questions, keep sending them. Um, final discussant is Wenshun Q, specialist in physical and rehab medicine, uh, who leads the uh, allogeneic cell therapy program at the Mayo Clinic. He's recently published a meta-analysis of MSCs for treating uh, ARDS. And uh, Wenshun, we're delighted to have you and have you share your insights. Thank you. Uh, let me try uh, to share my screen right now. Share screen and perfect. So I think it is working. Um, thank you, Fred. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, in this panel. And as uh, Dr. San Filippo has uh, alluded, the uh, uh, COVID-19 is a multi-organ inflammatory condition, which is ex uh, especially true in the lung. And here is the illustration of, of the process, the pathophysiological processes of uh, ARDS infection leading to COVID-19. So the infection of the virus in the alveoli apparently causes a exuberant inflammatory response where uh, T cells are activated, uh, inflammatory cytokines are released, and uh, the uh, uh, pro-inflammatory uh, subtype of macrophage M1 
is, is a, a converted. So th those activities apparently cause the leakage of the fluid and you know, the, the, um, uh, of, into the lung and causing the acute respiratory distress syndrome. The cell therapy actually is a, uh, uh, the uh, hypothesis uh, is to uh, control the T cell redirection and uh, convert M1 uh, to M2 uh, uh, subtype of the macrophage, which is a uh, anti-inflammatory subtype and modulate the inflammatory cytokines leading to recovery of the you know, improvement of the uh, environment of the alveoli and leading to recoveries. Uh, those uh, hypotheses has been tested in uh, uh, multiple uh, clinical studies at this point. And so far, 11 studies has been reported, including uh, case reports, case series, and also uh, media release. A total of 138 patients has been described in those reports. Uh, those uh, patients uh, range uh, between 18 to 77 years uh, old, and then there's about 20% of female in it. In none of the studies, female is more than uh, is the majority. Uh, most of the studies are happening in China and the United States, and also there are studies happening in Spain. One of the uh, biggest studies that has been reported came out of Wuhan, China, where 31 patients were reported. And uh, uh, very importantly, it is noted that no related adverse events was reported, therefore is safe to use. And uh, it is a uh, intravenous infusion of the MSC uh, for this COVID-19 patient. Um, uh, 30 patients uh, convert the PCR to negative in 10.7 days out of 31. So that is one of the uh, uh, clinical reports, uh, outcomes they reported. In the meanwhile, uh, they did follow on the laboratory parameters and the pulmonary functions. If you see the blue line at the bottom of the table, it shows the pulmonary function improved over time, but also there is a lymphocyte uh, count that improves uh, significantly. We know ARDS uh, starts from a lymphopenia, so lymph uh, side uh, improvement is very important for the patient's uh, immune functions. Also, C-reactive protein improved also statistically significantly within these 30 patients. Interleukin-6 also improves the decrease by quite a large margin and with a p-value of less than 0.001. So that is quite an improvement. D-dimer also improved. So, but over time, how that improved and what's the time course of that improvement? Here's a uh, case report uh, that also came out of China where the, uh, uh, follow the patients over the time course and look at the uh, parameters, including the lymphocytes, also look at the uh, interleukin-6 and CRP. You can see that the patient receives the treatment on this February the 5th. So that's um, where the patient gets started uh, with the MIC infusion. He also get a repeat infusion on February the 6th. Uh, and also another one at February the 8th. So the time course of the change occurs at about uh, five days after the first infusion, and it is about like three days uh, after the third infusion. I'm trying to, so uh, the lymphocytes, apparently uh, it decreases from this um, February the 5th, uh, and if you look at the uh, February 11, and uh, it increases, and then you know, on February 17th, it uh, almost doubles. The CRP uh, decreases uh, 
and uh, became normal on February the 17th, and then interleukin-6 decreases at the fifth day after the first infusion and uh, the third day after the third infusion, and it normalizes. So these are the time course. I obey this is just for one patient to provide some granularity. This patient has the baseline of increased of those uh, inflammatory markers, but this just uh, give us a peak of the course of uh, activities that is the, of the change. So the safety profile of all these studies has been good. Five studies did report some adverse events, events, but none of them has been deemed as related to the MSC therapy. So MSC therapy shares a common uh, pathophysiological pathophysiolog process with the acute respiratory distress syndrome because that is one of the stages, uh, severe stages of the COVID-19. So lessons can be learned from the MSC therapy for the ARDS. Based on our uh, meta-analysis of the ARDS uh, with the MSC therapy, uh, we have uh, found that there has been five studies that are com comparative studies uh, with control groups and uh, cell therapy groups. A total uh, patient population was 179, uh, and uh, four studies of these five studies showed a trend of decreased mortality rate. One study that showed an increased mortality rate uh, was reported that a higher or more severe baseline uh, severity of the patients in the treatment group. So the overall mortality, mortality uh, rates uh, was 25% for the MSC treated patients and 43% in controls. We know that they did not accomplish a statistical uh, significance just because uh, one of the uh, major reasons is we don't have the study big enough to drive the power. The forest plot on the right lower hand shows, if you look at the very bottom, a overall re relative risk of mortality for the patients of MSC therapy is 0 0.63, that means cell therapy patients, patients receiving cell therapy has a 37% of a reduction of the relative risk in, uh, in, uh, in death. So this is a, a very important uh, uh, point that, so there is a potential that the um, MSC therapy may uh, improve uh, the um, uh, patients, uh, uh, reduce the patient's uh, risk of death. And also, uh, if you look at the upper part of the screen on the safety, this uh, none of the studies has showed treatment-related serious adverse events. There has been some adverse events that were mild or resolved without treatment uh, that is related to the MSC therapy. So lessons learned from these studies is that Cell therapy, it targets by targeting the pathophysiology processes and uh, 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 has been tested to show some promise of uh, reducing the mortality of uh, uh, COVID-19, but also has shed some light to the mechanisms of the inflammatory processes uh, as a response to the cell therapy. Further success depends on large-scale clinical trials, and, uh, and that's um, the act, uh, alliance of cell therapy now is uh, really trying to improve on this and leading these uh, trials and and make uh, uh, make this field move forward. And thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you, Wenchen. Really appreciate uh, that insight and the studies you're doing. We've got a number of questions, so maybe we can start on mechanisms. Um, number of questions on the potential mechanisms involved in, in COVID-induced uh, inflammation in a variety of organs and how MSCs might uh, mitigate that inf inflammation. And maybe we can start, Josh, with you, because there's been a lot of information studies on the nature of myocarditis in particular 
uh, that's associated with COVID. Um, your thoughts as to uh, what actually might be going on in the range of uh, heart inflammatory disorders that are seen and how MSCs could, uh, again, mitigate uh, those, those processes. You're muted, muted. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. Um, so, um, yeah, I think one of the complexities in the field is that when you go to cell therapy as compared to some of the earlier generations of therapeutics that have been alluded to, um, specific, uh, specific individual proteins or synthesized chemicals, there's, there's a, shift, a paradigm shift because the mesenchymal stem cell as a living human cell releases literally thousands of uh, proteins and other types of mediators, including uh, small microvessels called uh, vesicles called exosomes. And the cells are able to therefore exert a large number of effects. And we've been aware, those of us working in the field have been aware of the immunologic effects since we very first began to use these cells. The cells can have favorable effects both on acute inflammation and on chronic inflammation. And in chronic inflammation, um, organs heal by forming scar tissue and fibrosis. And we learned very early on that cell therapy with MSCs can reduce fibrosis that is uh, set into, into a tissue. As far as the acute effects, I showed that very busy cartoon in, in, in my slides, and it shows that the cells are releasing somewhere between 10 and 20, maybe more specific protein mediators that can have differential differing effects on the different cells of the immune system. So they're able to affect the cells that are releasing the interleukin-6 and other pro-inflammatory mediators. They'll be able to shut that down while at the same time having effects that are aug augmenting the good parts of the immune system, the T and B cells that are necessary to fight off the, the viral infection. So they're resetting the balance through the release of multitudes of proteins and, uh, and and vesicles. In the cardiac field specifically, we know that a, a cytokine called tumor necrosis factor is very, very active in myocarditis and other forms of heart failure. And in a study we published four years ago, we showed that infusions of mesenchymal stem cells could reduce the levels of the tumor necrosis factor in heart failure patients by, uh, by up to 70% and keep that level of TNF down over a sustained period of time, up to six months. Great, thanks, Josh. You know, uh, Joanne, you spoke about MISC, uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Uh, I, again, can you talk maybe a little bit more in detail on what we think the, the inflammatory processes involved in that uh, might be uh, for different organs and how MSCs in particular might be effective in some areas and others. Uh, your findings in CP that MSCs uh, work in some cases uh, and, and, and not others. Uh, granted, we're talking about inflammation with MISC, but uh, be, be interesting, I think, for folks to hear your insights on that. Sure, so first to address CP, I think it's really important to understand that CP is not an inflammatory condition and it results from an injury years earlier generally and it's static at the time we're treating it, not progressive and not associated with ongoing inflammation. So it, it kind of makes sense to me that in that setting, you might not see MSCs be as effective as other cells that have different kinds of mechanisms of action. I think in M MISC, which is still really not completely understood, but, has, but shares a lot of features with Kawasaki syndrome, which is uh, another type of pro-inflammatory uh, syndrome that is the sequelae often of viral infection in children. Um, multiple organs are affected acutely so that these children are well and then have a few days of fever and then go into cardiovascular collapse, um, come in in heart failure uh, and need to be ventilated and sometimes need ECMO. Um, but the primary organ affected is not the lungs like it is in adult ARDS, it's more cardiac, renal, and neurologic. 
um, uh, like in ARDS in adults related to COVID, you see a cytokine release um, that is associated with the symptoms. And um, I don't think there's been an exhaustive study of which cytokines go up, but the ones that Josh mentioned, IL-6 and TNF-alpha um, and um, IL-2 have all been shown to be elevated in these children. Um, and the exact trigger isn't understood, but is probably some secondary effect of the an aberrant immune response to the virus. So it's as if they fight the virus initially, and then there's almost an autoimmune trigger that causes the immune system to, to, to be dysregulated, and then pro-inflammatory states uh, occur. Um, and we're hopeful that the MSCs will downregulate these many cytokines that have been released. And in many cases, it's a vicious cycle because once tissue is damaged, other cytokines are released as a result of that damage. Um, there are a lot of analogies for me to acute GVHD, where we know that um, IL-2 is elevated, that TNF is elevated, and that um, in the mesoblast application to uh, the FDA for their BLA, they were able to show that um, the MSCs down-regulated T cell proliferation um, through suppre suppression of the IL-2 receptor and that they um, also uh, were able to bind to the TNF uh, receptor one, which again, down-regulated TNF uh, release. So those at least are partially responsible for the mechanisms to reduce the pro-inflammatory state. That's what's known right now. And Wenshun, you spoke a lot about the mechanisms involving lung, which obviously is a primary target. Um, any other insights? And again, a lot of uh, data coming out on the various signatures of uh, cytokine cells that might be predictive or not predictive of increased severity of the disease. Yes, uh, the, uh, there are some uh, specific uh, features of this COVID-19. In the, uh, if you look at the uh, the patients, the COVID COVID-19 actually starts from a uh, lymphopenia, where you have actually the decrease of your lymphocytes. But where is that cytokine from? So the theory is that the cytokines actually are mostly from the macrophage, the M1 subtype of it, because that has been activated. And one of the mechanisms of the cell therapy and that has been uh, a major finding is that the cells has been found to convert the M1 subtype of macrophage to M2. So therefore the production, so the production factory of the uh, uh, inflammatory cytokines is shut down uh, to a point that you can find that the, uh, the uh, inflammatory molecules are less in, uh, in, the, uh, in the lung and then has been less in the, uh, in the serum you can uh, so identify. So that's one of the features. Also, uh, another uh, specific feature uh, is the cell actually produces interleukin-4 and interleukin-4. Uh, well, that's one of the mechanisms of converting M1 to M2. So these are the mechanisms T cell redirection, uh, Dr. Uh, Kurtzberg just uh, alluded to, where you are converting the uh, inflammatory T cells to the regulatory T cells, where the T cells are not going to uh, produce as uh, the uh, inflammatory cytokines. So these are the things that we talk about how to uh, control the inflammatory processes in patients with COVID-19. And of course, uh, corticosteroid has been brought up and it has been shown to be effective in uh, the clinical trial that has uh, happened in England. So cell therapy works on a different mechanism where it addresses the pathophysiological processes of the production of the cell uh, cytokines and then with a wider variety of inflammatory cytokines tackled upon by these MSCs. So therefore, so it's a different mechanism and it is very benign, hopefully uh, that will, uh, you know, with more clinical trials, we're gonna find out uh, how well it's gonna work. 
So, but the processes and the hypotheses are such that there is a great promise and hope that this can help. Great. Well, thanks. We've got uh, just a few minutes left and, and a lot of other questions, but this is a policy uh, conference. So I think a key question is uh, what are the next steps we need to be able to uh, demonstrate the efficacy in, in different patients for different uh, uh, processes um, and, and how do we move this along? So let's start, Josh, your thoughts. Again, you've been using these in compassionate use and you have INDs for randomized controlled trials. How do we move this forward? Accelerate well, the process. Yeah, we have, um, you know, we have a very experienced uh, group of investigators who've, who've worked together uh, very diligently over the last six months to think about the disease and to design trials. Um, many of us as investigators are very actively involved in, in trials of other treatments for, um, for COVID-19. Our center at Miami is very active in the vaccine trials, uh, for example. Um, I just say that as a background because I think what we, where we are is we've designed very, very uh, thoughtful trials that are adequately powered uh, by statisticians. We have the products available. We manufacture these products ourselves in our laboratories and have been doing so for many, many years. As uh, Dr. Kurtzberg alluded to in children, our group has, has emphasized uh, adults and older adults. We are... Uh, I would say shovel ready. Um, what we need is an, an infusion of funding from the federal government to bring these trials uh, to a reality. And I think we're in a position to get answers uh, very, very quickly um, because the trial has a rapid clinical course. Uh, there are lots and lots of patients still presenting in the United States. And we think this is a very important adjunctive therapy and um, we're ready to go with these trials. The trials are already designed and approved by the FDA and the IND. We simply need to be able to do them. Great, and Joanne, you've been a leader in getting uh, bone marrow and cord blood into uh, clinical uh, routine applications. Um, you have INDs for COVID uh, for adults uh, and for children, uh, <coughs> passionate use under those INDs. What do you think we need to be doing to advance this whole potential for MSCs to treat COVID? So I think it's really important for us to demonstrate in rigorous, randomized, blinded, placebo-controlled clinical trials, um, whether MSCs work or not. I also think that we need to uh, have some agreement on um, critical attributes of cells and characterization of cells so that we know, for example, that cells that Josh manufactures in his lab and cells that I manufacture in my lab uh, are, are similar and can perform the same way. I think we need to figure out for each indication a measure of potency for that application. Um, and then be able to have all the manufacturing laboratories use similar assays to demonstrate that. Um, and um, I think all of this is gonna take a significant investment of funding um, in, in order to do it right. Um, I think if we run the proper trials and we demonstrate safety and efficacy, then these uh, products should be taken to a BLA and approved by FDA so that they're available for the general public to use like you would use a drug. But that's a huge amount of work and a long pathway and it's expensive. Um, so investment is critical. Wenshan, your thoughts on uh, one of the questions that came up again was uh, where is Mayo Clinic in terms of uh, either compassionate use or, or uh, having trials for uh, COVID in particular? So we got a uh, IND approval for uh, a uh, compassionate use, and uh, we have been uh, uh, working, and then we got funding uh, for this. Uh, uh, but we don't have a, a large-scale clinical trial yet. I think uh, one of the this is the observation that we have in the world 58 trials registered with clinicaltrials.gov. However, uh, none of them are, they are all fragmented. 
that are happening in different places in diff with different products. And Dr. Hare just alluded to the fact that we need to, uh, Dr. Kirsberg alluded to the fact that we need to uh, have a uh, centralized kind of characterization of the products where, so we can talk about the mechanisms down the road and see how consistent the result would be. So the co coordination of all the fragmented part of the trials throughout the world uh, in the United States is key. And then I think act, uh, Alliance of Cell Therapy now that our trial, it is, an example of that, where we have multi-center uh, partners, where we're going to use the same product by the same characterization, and then we're going to uh, you, uh, do a large-scale trial. So that's just scientifically more rigor, and uh, I think that's uh, a very important perspective. And uh, I just I uh, want to say thank you for organizing this uh, uh, coordinated effort uh, in this uh, in this scale. And that is uh, critical and very, very important. Well, and again, you and Paul alluded to the fact that there is uh, compassionate use data out there. It'd be nice to have a registry to track those data rigorously. That real world data approach uh, could be very helpful to uh, supplement uh, what we're doing in terms of the uh, randomized control trials. But with uh, really just uh, two minutes left, maybe uh, each of you for 30 seconds, uh, if you had to advise the administration and Congress as to what to do. Uh, what should they do? 30 seconds, Wen Shan. I think it is critical that we got some funding. So, uh, well, of course, everybody would agree with that. So, this, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, large, but you know, this uh, group of people are very uh, uh, having a very good uh, stewardship to the funding, to the, you know, we're putting a lot of effort. Some fraction of the funding the government would, uh, is putting into the effort would be enough for us to move this field forward. We will be productive. Thank you. Great. Joanne, again, you've voiced this. You've, you've had to deal with this so many times on behalf of uh, the children that uh, you're involved with in, in getting these treatments to um, your thought, what should we be telling the administration in Congress? Well, I agree with Wen Chen. We need funding, we need an investment. Um, and if you just wanna focus on COVID for a second, I think that most of the funding today, at least federally is weighted towards vaccine development, which is critically important. And we all agree with that. However, it's not gonna be the final solution and people are still getting sick and we need to be able to treat those people along the way. And I think that there should be more balance between investing in the vaccine development and investing in treatments for the disease, because I, this is probably gonna be you know, the beginning of uh, a century where we deal with many different viruses that have these kinds of potential to make people sick. And we have to have a full, uh, like a deep bench, Coach K would say, so that we have multiple ways <laughs> to approach the, the disease and help the patients. Great, Josh, 30 seconds, last word, same yeah. issue. I would echo very much what uh, Wen Chen and Joanne said. Um, I would emphasize that we have all of the elements in place to be able to get an answer very quickly. And I think that's what's critical is, um, you know, maybe they, maybe they don't work. Uh, we, uh, that, that's the purpose of a randomized placebo controlled trial is to tell you whether they do or they don't. We are uh, well poised to do a decisive placebo controlled properly powered study now. Uh, Joanne emphasized the need to assess the critical quality attributes of the cells. All of that infrastructure is in place. So we'd just like to um, encourage some federal investment in this hypothesis to get an answer. Um, it, the vaccine may be very effective, but, we're, but everybody's worried about the populations who may not respond well to the vaccine or may not take the vaccine, the elderly in particular. And so they, uh, they, will, they will be patients who continue to get sick with COVID-19 even after a vaccine is approved. Great. Well, thank you all. It's been a great discussion. Uh, we all appreciate the terrific work you're doing and um, uh, thanks again. And thanks for those of you who've joined in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Well, we're sorry Dr. Michael Mathay had a last minute conflict and was unable to join our panel on Wednesday.
but he's kindly agreed to take this session to add to our discussion on insights on outcomes using MSCs for patients with COVID. Michael is a critical care specialist at UCSF who's led MSC trials for ARDS and now COVID as a well-recognized expert in this area. Welcome, Michael. Now with the importance of lung disease in COVID infected patients, please give us your insights on how MSC therapy might be helpful. Thank you, Fred, for that nice introduction. My slides are intended to explore the use of mesenchymal stromal cells for COVID-19, and I'll provide some background for why we have enthusiasm for this approach. These are my disclosures. There are no conflicts for this presentation. Um, now, what I'd like to do briefly is just review the rationale and preclinical data for mesenchymal stromal cells treatment of ARDS. I'll show you briefly uh, data on phase one and 2A trials that are completed and published, and then conclude with a discussion of the phase 2B STAT trial that we have ongoing. Okay, this slide shows a chest radiograph of the ARDS with a panel on the right showing protein-rich pulmonary edema. ARDS occurs in approximately 200,000 patients annually in the U.S. prior to the development of COVID-19 pandemic. Main etiologies are bacterial and viral pneumonia, sepsis, aspiration, and trauma. Supportive treatment has improved outcomes, but we're still searching for a more specific treatment. This slide gives a, an example of one of our early clinical studies, which uh, indicated the potential value of MSCs in reducing pulmonary edema and lung injury in a mouse model of uh, lung injury. Uh, this slide shows that uh, MSCs when treated in mouse uh, who, develop, who had developed bacterial pneumonia with E. coli had a marked increase in survival and uh, in addition, we found that human MSCs were just as effective as intratracheal or uh, intravenous MSCs. This slide shows now our advancing preclinical studies in which we tested the MSCs in an ex vivo human lung model, which we use in our laboratory. And in brief, MSCs reduced the severity of endotoxin and E. coli pneumonia when given as treatment compared to controls. Uh, this shows the data from one of those studies in which um, you see on the y-axis endothelial permeability on the left-hand side with endotoxin increasing at threefold and then treatment with MSCs or the condition media of MSCs returning it to normal. A similar beneficial effect is shown on the right-hand panel with a wet to dry ratio indicating that MSCs reduce the degree of pulmonary edema. At this point in time, we realized there was a potential for translation of MSCs to clinical uh, applications and to work then with the NIH repository through the blood division at the University of Minnesota. And from this time forward, we used their human bone marrow derived MSCs, which were a clinical grade level. We tested their um, uh, product in our human lung model and found again, the same efficacy we had found with our other preclinical studies. In addition, we also discovered that MSCs had a previously unrecognized antibacterial effect. And this slide shows that in the presence of issues was markedly increased. Finally, FDA, when we applied to them, requested that we do large animal studies to be sure about safety of MSCs before going into clinical trials. So we uh, collaborated with Dr. Traber and Dr. Ankabatar in doing a series of sheep studies in which we uh, matched the clinical problem of severe pneumonia and sepsis and gave MSCs at two different doses along with controls. And this slide shows that oxygenation was improved uh, in, the, um, in the sheep treated with the higher or the lower dose of MSCs. The control is in blue, and you can see the PF ratio, the standard clinical index of hypoxemia, fell dramatically in the sheep um, uh, over 24 hours. But treatment with MSCs one hour after the insult resulted in improved oxygenation that was statistically significant at 24 hours. Next slide shows 
that the quantity of pulmonary edema as measured by the wet to dry ratio was reduced uh, significantly in with a higher dose of MSCs, which was 10 million cells per kilogram. So that then was uh, selected for the clinical trials. There were no safety issues in these uh, sheep trials, which was uh, reassuring to FDA and to ourselves. Next slide just summarizes the uh, pathways uh, by which um, MSCs have the potential to reduce lung injury and improve recovery. Um, on the left-hand side, you see a standard uh, illustration of lung injury with hand side having a protein-rich pink pulmonary edema fluid. And with uh, MSCs, we know they have several anti-inflammatory properties for, with release of lipoxin A4, IL-1-RA, IL-10, and M2 resolving monocytes. They also restore endothelial and epithelial barrier integrity through the release of several molecules listed here. And they probably have the potential to increase type two cell regeneration and to enhance alveolar and lung edema, edema fluid clearance. And as I mentioned, antimicrobial properties. This slide now then advances to the clinical trials. We received an IND from uh, FDA to begin with a phase one trial, dose escalation with nine patients. And um, uh, that was successful with uh, no, no safety issues. And then FDA approved to move on to a phase 2A trial. They, ins they wanted us to do two to one randomization, MSC to placebo, to maximize data on any potential safety issues. And only one dose of MSCs was permitted for this initial trial. Uh, this is the phase one results that I referred to published in Lance Restroid Medicine 2015 with no uh, adverse events. Uh, this slide shows the um, inclusion criteria for the phase 2A trial of testing the MSCs in moderate to severe ARDS, PF less than 200 with bilateral infiltrates and within 96 hours of developing ARDS. And this trial focused on non-traumatic causes of ARDS. The exclusions are listed here, uh, moderate to severe liver disease, treatment of cancer in the prior two years, chronic lung disease, pulmonary hypertension, ECMO, moribund, uh, adults only, and trauma within the prior five days. Uh, the phase 2A trial was multi-center, randomized, placebo-controlled. The uh, MSCs were given over one hour intravenously or the placebo. We were all blinded. 60 patients, two to one randomization, safety endpoints were the primary and efficacy endpoints were secondary. And we we're of course very underpowered for them in this trial. And then biomarkers were studied in the PLAS BAL. Uh, the, the results of the study showed that safety um, as the primary endpoint was uh, excellent. There was no evidence of any of the pre-specified infusion associated adverse events. Uh, or any of the other um, criteria listed here. In terms of the uh, baseline characteristics of the patients in the trial, as so often happens in um, small trials, the patients randomized to the MSC group were quite a bit sicker than the ones in the placebo trial, as illustrated best by the Apache score in red on this slide of 104 versus 89 in the placebo group. This slide shows the um, 28-day and 60-day mortality in the patients in the trial. This is really a safety analysis because we're underpowered for any mortality signal in a trial that's this small. And when we adjusted for the Apache 3 score, you can see that the, um, the uh, groups were not different. The hazard ratio was 1.19 with the p-value of 0 0.74. The next slide shows data for the effect of MSCs on oxygenation index. Oxygenation index is a very excellent criteria by which to evaluate severity of respiratory failure. And what this shows um, is a trend for improvement of oxygenation index at day one, day two, and day three, and the MSC treated versus the placebo controlled patients, though this is a secondary analysis and not conclusive. The next slide shows that we found a marked decrease in the angiopoietin II levels in the plasma of the MSC-treated patients, which is important because this indicates a biologic effect that's favorable. Uh, 
Ang Tu is both a mediator and a marker of systemic and lung injury. The next slide uh, gives the results of a uh, atherosis sponsored trial using their multi-stem trial. Similar to ours, although smaller numbers, and this shows a favorable trend for 28 day mortality and uh, also ventilator free days. Again, you have to interpret this with caution because it's a small trial, but basically shows no safety issues and a favorable result. Now this slide um, uh, defines our current ongoing phase 2B trial, which is focused on efficacy. And this is the STAT trial. It's multi-center randomized blinded placebo controlled trial Study agent is given over one hour intravenously. Again, 10 million cells, MSCs per kilogram. The goal is 120 ARDS patients with, in this case, one-to-one -one randomization. Efficacy endpoint is the primary, um, uh, um, primary in this trial, oxygenation index, and we stratify the patients by trauma versus non-trauma and the PF ratio and measure biomarkers and it's funded by the Department of Defense primarily, but also with uh, support from NHLBI and CERN. This slide shows a map to indicate where our clinical sites are. This trial began in January 2020, and uh, then COVID hit in February 2020. We have four sites that are open, UCSF San Francisco, UCSF Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, um, Texas, University of Texas in Houston, and Oregon Health Science University. We are looking forward to opening, uh, in addition, Vanderbilt and University of Washington, Seattle, and UC Davis. We've enrolled 32 patients to date. 30 have been COVID-19 positive. And the goal, as I said, is to enroll 120 patients. Uh, and the last slide is just my acknowledgments to the many uh, physicians and collaborators have made this possible, including, of course, um, a great to the patients who consent to be part of these trials and the intensive care unit, nursing and respiratory care staff. Thank you. Thanks, Michael, for a great presentation. Uh, we're really looking forward to the outcome of that trial. Uh, during the session, we had a number of questions on how the immunologic mechanisms involved in COVID-induced inflammation and how MSCs might mitigate that inflammation. Um, in particular, with the uh, evolving data on cellular humoral cytokine responses in the lung during COVID infection, what are your thoughts as to how these variable inflammatory responses in different patients might be uh, mitigated by MSC therapy? Well, it's a good question, Fred. I would say that, um, of course, COVID-19 is a viral pneumonia. We do have preclinical data in one study that um, MSCs were effective against an inflammatory uh, uh, influenza viral pneumonia, but we don't know from preclinical data how MSCs might work in SARS-CoV-2. However, uh, likely that the MSCs will mitigate and reduce unwanted inflammation in the lung. Right. Well, you know, since this is a policy conference, uh, there were several practical questions that have come up. Um, and the first is really, how do we accelerate our understanding of the potential value of MSC therapy for COVID patients? And is there sufficient evidence to move to larger trials? Well, I think it would be useful to have more trials and larger trials. I also think it'd be valuable to have trials with two doses of MSCs to maximize their potential effect. Uh, perhaps uh, one dose like we are doing within um, 72 hours of the onset of ARDS and maybe a second dose at uh, day two or day three. The, um, the, um, the need for more trials is evident. I have calculated COVID-19 by an estimate, and it's a large number. Um, briefly, if we've had almost 200,000 deaths in the United States so far in the first eight months of COVID-19. And if the mortality is 20 to 
And at least half of those had ARDS, probably that's a conservative number, then the total number of cases of ARDS from COVID-19 approaches 400,000 or 500,000. So we need more trials to test MSCs in this population. And uh, of course now, since there are other therapies that do help with um, COVID-19, such as remdesivir, the antiviral agent, and the new data this week on baricitinab, those can be added to the therapeutic um, uh, th therapy for these patients. And dexamethasone has a benefit too. So it would be good to have MSC trials in the setting of these other therapies to see if MSCs would add further therapeutic benefit. You know, obviously the uh, results of FDA IND approved uh, randomized controlled trials are critically important, uh, but we're also seeing some data for uh, patients who are being treated under compassionate use uh, FDA approved INDs as well. And what are your thoughts about how we might be able to better use these kind of data as well? Especially since we've been talking for a couple of years now uh, with the FDA, HRSA, NIH about uh, establishing a cell therapy registry for patients being treated under uh, IND approved compassionate use? Well, I think it's good to have a registration or a registry uh, mechanism to keep track of patients who are treated. However, at the end of the day, uh, compassionate use will not um, be uh, successful in. Uh, in uh, establishing efficacy of MSCs. Uh, you just have to have randomized trials, just like it's been done with remdesivir, most recently with baricitinab, and the recovery trial of dexamethasone. So I'm in favor of a registry, but I'm more in favor of funding for randomized controlled trials. Yeah, I think, uh, I think we would all agree with that strongly, no question about it. Um, so what do you think are the next steps to uh, be able to bring these therapies to patients? Uh, what actions are needed? Uh, and, and in particular, how should we get this work funded? Well, I think like in many cases, the efforts of individual investigators working together is critical. I mean, our, our research group was probably the first one to start working on the possibility that MSCs might be effective in ARDS. It goes back now actually uh, 15 years. So we've had a strong focus, but all along we brought in collaborators within our own group as well as elsewhere. So I think a multi-center approach is definitely helpful. And then the second issue is to um, work out the source of the MSCs, the production of them, um, as that's another important uh, issue. And finally, I think it's very valuable and important to include biologic studies in the trials. Great points. And, you know, those are uh, the ones that Peter Marks made uh, during the session with the FDA directors as well, right on target. So one final question, what should we be telling Congress and the administration that they need to do to move this potential for MSC therapy to COVID patients? Well, I think if possible, Congress should support more funding for cell-based therapy for ARDS. Um, it can be done um, as a multi-center approach. And um, I think that there are a lot of investigators in the United States who are willing to work together to make this happen. It's a big job to run clinical trials, um, but with the right funding support, I think that this can be done uh, very well. I, um, I think it's good to have both industry and NIH participation in the trials. I favor both. Um, so I think uh, more funding from Congress would be helpful, particularly in this COVID-19 pandemic. Again, I think we'd all agree with that. Uh, so Michael, thanks for taking the time to join us and we really do appreciate the important work that you're doing. Well, thank you, appreciate the entire focus of this group and conference. I think it's very helpful. Thank you. Well, thanks again for joining uh, for us for this uh, really important session on the potential uh, benefit of uh, MSCs for patients with COVID. Uh, a lot of great uh, information provided in terms of potential mechanisms, the immunologic aspects, the inflammatory aspects of this. And basically as a policy uh, uh, session, how we move this forward 
And I think uh, during the course of the day, we heard from other groups as well that uh, the opportunity is before us. Trials are underway. We need larger trials. We need multi-center trials uh, that are randomized controlled appropriately. Several of these uh, have been approved by the FDA. Key question now is how do we get the funding to uh, initiate those trials? So thanks again for joining us.